Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains inept. Yep. Yep, we're sticking with that. Fair enough. Okay, insult myself. Why not? And today, we are going to discuss a case of failure, actually, which we talk about a lot, but in this case, it involves a particular company. No, not that one. In fact, this company has routinely... I've seen people say that it's the British Rail of America, but that's not fair to British Rail at all. The British Rail had its problems, sure, but they did make some smart decisions after a while, and managed to save a lot of rail lines in the UK. I give them a lot of flack because it's a meme on this channel, but the truth is that they didn't always screw up. You know what company did always pretty much, for the most part, completely screw up? And didn't even last three years before declaring bankruptcy? Penn Central. Yep, Penn Central. A company born out of a merger between the Pennsylvania Railroad and New York Central. It should have been a match made in heaven, as they were both the dominant forces when it came to the east coast of America and the railroads. And yet, it was a complete and total disaster. This is the story of the failure of Penn Central. The late 1940s and into the 1950s were starting to become really, really rough for a lot of rail lines. With the advent of the interstate highway system in America, many families owning their own cars, as well as the affordability of modern air travel, people just weren't using the rail lines to travel nearly as much. And even the freight department was suffering, with many companies choosing to ship by truck instead. Now out west, railroads like Union Pacific were able to stay afloat due to the distances involved out there. Shipping goods by plane was not very efficient unless you needed it to get there, like, tomorrow. And sending a massive amount of goods a long distance wasn't necessarily great going by truck. Trains were still better for shipping in bulk and long distances, and companies like Union Pacific and Santa Fe weren't doing as well as they once had, but were still doing alright. But the East Coast was a lot more densely populated, with a lot more short-haul runs. And the railroad's short-haul runs were slowly being taken over by trucking and aircraft. Whether it's passenger or freight, they were being sandwiched between these two other mediums for travel. And it was beginning to cause problems. New York Central and the Penzi had been rivals for a very, very long time. And their lines often ran parallel to each other. The notion of them merging was something that had been debated in the late 1950s, but neither company really wanted to do that because they just didn't really like each other. They managed themselves in very different ways, which will be relevant later. But a lot of other rail companies over on the East Coast were starting to merge in order to bail themselves out of the situation. The Erie Railroad had merged with Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western to become Erie Lackawanna Railway in 1960. Chesapeake and Ohio Railway wound up acquiring control of Baltimore and Ohio, and Norfolk and Western actually absorbed several railroads, which included the Nickel Plate and Wabash. Both New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad had looked to merge with some of these other smaller railways around them, but none of them were interested in merging with them in particular. So really, it was down to just them. Another problem they were working with was the ICC, or the Interstate Commerce Commission. The ICC was a government entity that was put into place by the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887. They were specifically meant originally just to regulate the railroads to ensure fair rates and eliminate rate discrimination. Back then, railroad tycoons were either slashing prices or charging extraordinary prices if they had a monopoly on a certain area. The ICC was meant to limit this, but by this time, some of their policies were largely becoming obsolete. They wouldn't just allow the railroads to raise or lower their rates very easily. And this made it very difficult for any rail line in America to stay competitive with either trucking or the airlines. They were largely in the way at this point, rather than actually helping. 
They also were in charge of approving such a massive merger because both New York Central and the Penzi were enormous rail lines on their own. When they combined, Penn Central was an absolute gargantuan rail line, and none of them were even sure if the ICC was going to allow them to do it just because of how much territory they would encompass. The ICC would eventually allow this, but it would take nearly 10 years for them to actually approve it, as they were notorious for dragging their feet when it came to mergers of any kind. Because of course they were. Can we please merge now? Nope. How about now? Nope. C can we do it now? Mm, no. The ICC only approved the merger following a handful of conditions. The new company, which was to be called Penn Central, had to take over the freight and passenger operations of the bankrupt New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad. They did this on December 31st, 1968, but they never really wanted to do that. New Haven was a complete frickin' disaster at that time. They hadn't been making profits in years on any of their lines. Managing them and attempting to make them work was something that they didn't want to have to deal with, but they didn't really have a choice. They also were supposed to absorb New York, Susquehanna, and Western Railway. They attempted it, but they couldn't actually agree on the price, so NYS and W actually wound up becoming part of the Delaware Otsego system. They were also to make the Lehigh Valley Railroad available for merger by either N&W or C&O. If neither of them wanted it, they were supposed to absorb it themselves. Lehigh Valley was reluctant to merge in general and struggled along on their own and actually wound up entering bankruptcy a little after Penn Central would. Spoiler on that. But either way, Penn Central went ahead, officially being a thing on February 1st, 1968. At the time of the merger, Alfred E. Perlman had been the head of New York Central, and I've always thrown shade at him for his policy for not preserving any steam locomotives because I think it is stupid, but outside of that he did make a lot of legitimately good business decisions, and he had been generally responsible for keeping New York Central afloat, and he was known to be a forward-thinking innovator. He pushed for dieselization, obviously, but he also made a lot of changes to streamline the operations of New York Central in general, saving them money in the long run. Many of his innovations are actually standard things that a lot of Class 1 railroads use now. The Penzi had been headed by a man named Stuart T. Saunders, who was a lot more conservative than Perlman. He wasn't necessarily bad at his job, but he and the rest of the Penzi suits were very, very old school in their approach, and this would create a lot of friction between the two sides. They were supposed to be working together, but New York Central's team, which was known as Green Hats, and the Penzi's team, which was known as the Red Hats, were at odds with a lot of policy decisions. Perlman desperately wanted the entire railway to move forward and innovate. Saunders was kind of on his side to a degree, but a lot of the board members weren't. And this created a lot of friction over time. The merger itself was also a strange one, as normally when rail lines merge, it's to extend their operations. It's normally an end-to-end -end merger sort of thing, just to make the lines longer. But in Penn Central's case, the original railways had occupied much of the same territory, with most of the lines running parallel to one another. This created a lot of redundancies, things that would desperately need to be streamlined, as they'd already had a ton of track that they weren't using even by themselves. Now they basically doubled their infrastructure, and their taxes, and they didn't need the vast majority of it. In fact, paying for stuff they really didn't need would encompass a lot of their misfortunes. It was actually most of their problems. Perlman didn't even want to merge with the Penzi in the first place. He felt that their rail lines were not as immaculate and as strong as they appeared outwardly. And to a certain extent, he may have been right, because the Penzi's board members weren't willing to innovate and they desperately needed to in that era. Penn Central's total assets upon the merger were more than five billion in 1968 money, and they had a projected revenue of more than 1.7 billion annually. That sounds really good, and on paper it was, but there'd been a significant lack of management when it came to actually running such a massive railroad and integrating two railroads that really didn't run the same. Their corporate structure was completely different, and so was the way they handled their trains. Under the merger, Perlman was the president director and the chief administrative officer, while Saunders was the railroad's chairman and CEO. 
And these two in particular seem to have worked all right together, but Saunders was not Perlman. He had a lot more of a reserved ideology, and he was known to be a strong negotiator, but he was also kind of an appeaser. One of the major problems the railroad had was the payroll. They just had too many employees. Normally when companies merge, there's an elimination process. Duplicate routes are torn up, terminals, trackage, and redundant things in general are taken out of the company because they just don't need them. Why pay the taxes and upkeep when you aren't using it? It doesn't make any sense. And to be honest, I know Twitter's gonna hate this, but employees fall under that category too. There are times when layoffs need to happen to keep a company afloat. I know being at the bottom and looking up, you might think that these companies have an infinite amount of money and therefore can afford it, but you know what? That's not always true. Many of these companies are, in fact, living in glass houses that could easily shatter if any mistake is made. And in Penn Central's case, that's exactly what happened. They had a ton of money. Their net worth was ludicrous for the time. And yet, they failed, and part of the reason is that they didn't get rid of hardly any employees. In fact, they got more. Saunders had been responsible for negotiating with the unions and gave in to pretty much every single thing the unions wanted. And unions are there to protect employees, and I get that. Also, they take a part of your checkout for that protection, which seems really toxic. Actually, wait a minute, I don't know if this is supposed to work that way. You became the very thing you sought to destroy. But unions also usually don't take into account the companies need to stay afloat. I mean, you're there to protect people's jobs, but ironically, in some cases, like this one, they were directly responsible for people losing their jobs because the company went under. Saunders chose to agree to the terms that every employee from both companies was retained, that huge severance packages were promised to anyone who was fired, and several thousand more employees were rehired that had been laid off previously. Honestly, even just one of these demands was a stretch for the company at the time. If it were me, I'd tolerate the severance packages, maybe, but every employee from both companies being retained? That just doesn't make any sense. You're basically paying a bunch of guys to stand around because there just wasn't work for them. And rehiring a bunch of other employees? Are you kidding me? No, of course not. Ridiculous. But Saunders gave in, and this caused Penn Central's payroll to skyrocket, to the point that operating costs were way higher than they should have been. We want all the things! You want everything? Yes, we want everything! Give it to us now! The workers demand it! Also, they pay us dues! But, it, but if we give you everything, we can't afford anything! Too bad! Give us it all! Okay, you can have whatever you want! I'm sorry! Don't yell at me! Saunders, you agreed to give them how much money? I'm sorry, Mr. Pearlman. You know what this means, Saunders. It means it's time for my chainsaw. I'm sorry, Mr. Pearlman, please. Prior to the merger, the respective railway's operating ratios were always pretty high. An operating ratio is a term that describes operating expenses as a percentage when it compared to the revenue of a company. Naturally, you always want that to be below 100, but anything over 80 is considered very high. By modern standards, Class 1 railroads these days usually try to stay within about the 60% margin. Naturally, they want to get it lower because, of course, that means more profit for them, but it's not always feasible. Either way, prior to the merger, both New York Central and the Penzi had operating ratios that were above 81%. With the extra payroll and infrastructure they didn't need, that went well above 100. And even when they did merge, their cash reserves, like extra money just sitting around just in case, was only about 13 million. Which again, sounds like a lot, but for a railway this size, it wasn't. Even the Penzi by itself needed more than three times that amount every day for operating expenses. So, what's the job today, Barry? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. They uh, hired a bunch of other guys to do it, so we uh, got nothing to do. Just standing around. We're, we're standing around and getting paid for it? Yeah, that's about right. Oh. Can the company afford that? I, I don't know, man. I don't ask these questions. I still don't know what a steam engine is. For the love of God, Barry, how many times do I have to explain this? Now, it wasn't like Perlman and Saunders were stupid. They knew a lot of this. Saunders made a mistake by giving in to the unions, but it might have been fixed if they had cut costs in other areas. For example, one of the things he and Perlman wanted to do was construct new automated freight yards at both Selkirk and Albany, New York, as well as adding another one over in Columbus, Ohio. These yards would streamline operations quite a bit and save them money, 
and New York Central had actually been implementing such upgrades for a while under Perlman, the Pansy had ignored such an idea entirely. They also wanted to introduce an early computerized system for monitoring and tracing freight cars. This kind of technology was very innovative back then, and is actually standard these days in upgraded form. Such a thing would have helped Penn Central overall if they could have implemented it, but they never had the chance to. Normally with a merger, you want things to be slow and processed out. You want to ease people into it rather than just thrusting the companies together and letting them fend for themselves, which is actually what they wound up doing. The reason they did this was because of the ICC. They had taken so long to approve the merger that neither side of the arrangement was really sure it would ever happen. So neither New York Central or the Penzi wanted to invest the capital into the programs. When the ICC finally did give them the go-ahead, they had to merge their operating departments from day one. They had hoped that doing something so catastrophic would actually just kind of work itself out. It didn't. It resulted in mass chaos. You see, for example, none of the classification clerks that were responsible for planning the routes for the freight cars and stuff had actually been taught the roughly 5,000 new combinations for those routings. Thousands of cars began being sent to the completely wrong yards. Basic locations were a mystery to some of the staff. One time, former New York Central employees, now under Penn Central of course, had to make sure one of the cars was sent to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Harrisburg, by the way, is the capital of PA. It's kind of a major city in the state. As the capital, I'm just throwing it out there. Well, the former New York Central employees didn't know where Harrisburg was, so they sent it to Pittsburgh instead, which is like four hours drive away. It's really not even close. This horrific mismanagement also nearly destroyed another railway that had nothing to do with Penn Central, Bangor and Aristook. They were a small railroad that served northern Maine, and they were often called just the Bar. A major source of their freight operations had actually been potatoes. Potato farming was very common up in Maine. They grew well, and farmers sold them to the rest of the country. It was pretty normal. They shipped them by rail because it was the most efficient means to do so. They could send an entire season's worth of potatoes on the railways and get them to the rest of the country and make their sales. Good deal. And it had been a profitable venture for everybody involved for many years. But like I said, the bar was small. They had to go through Penn Central to get their shipment to the rest of the country. But when they did this in 1969, Penn Central lost the shipment at the Selkirk Yard. That shipment consisted of the entire season's worth of potatoes. The whole crop rotted in the yard because they screwed it up. A lot of farms with no revenue from selling their potatoes because they couldn't sell rotted potatoes wound up shutting down. And the ones that could make it through the crisis swore never to use the rail lines to ship their crops ever again. The bar was nearly forced into bankruptcy from losing such a massive source of their revenue. And it just made Penn Central look even more silly. It wasn't like the suits weren't aware of the problems, but each side had a very different method for how to deal with it. The red hats of the Penzi and the green hats of New York Central kept arguing with each other. The green hats had been hired mostly by Perlman and they were young, ambitious, and forward thinking. And the red hats were old school, old men who wanted things to stay the way they already were and do what worked, not try new experiments. They didn't get along and their arguing wasted time while their rail line was hemorrhaging money all over the place. A man named David Bidvon, who had come in from the Penzi, was actually head of Penn Central's financial department. He was known to be kind of full of himself, but he was very good at his job. He was a numbers guy. And then one of the things he wound up doing to help Penn Central stay afloat and hopefully fix their trouble was take out as just a stupid amount of loans that would help finance their operations. The problem with loans is this. You had to pay them back. And you had to pay them back with interest. So in the long run, it only compounded Penn Central's problems. Bavon's thinking that eventually the railroad would straighten itself out and be profitable again, and they could start paying off their massive debt. This would never actually occur, though. Perlman had also been known to be very outspoken, wanting things done a certain way. And to be fair, he was often correct in his analysis. But the former Penzi brass really hated just the heck out of him for it. These darn kids don't know how to run a rail line like we do. All I'm simply suggesting, men, is that we try to innovate and limit our costs. We don't have to innovate. We're old. Old people don't need to change. 
No, you don't understand. We won't be around forever, and times are changing. It's just time for a new methodology, a new outlook on railroad. No, never. We will never change. Not for you, not for anyone else. Saunders, quick, back us up on this. Yeah, I agree with that. We should, probably shouldn't change at all. And maybe we give the union some more money. I think that's a good idea. They managed to con Saunders into getting enough votes to stage a coup and have Perlman removed from his position, replacing him on August 29th, 1969 with a man named Paul Gorman instead. Perlman was actually given mostly a lame duck position of vice chairman. Eventually, he would just kind of leave. And he wound up proving that he probably knew exactly what he was talking about when he came to what he wanted to do. He became the head of Western Pacific, which had been struggling for a while, and swiftly turned their bad situation around right before it was finally purchased by Union Pacific. Under Gorman, well, Penn Central's situation didn't change, like, at all. It was still horrible. They were still just bleeding cash all over the lines, just everywhere. And all Bavon kept doing was keep the creditors quiet and trying to find new sources for loans. More loans, because he had nothing else he could possibly do about the situation. Then, he did something rather, uh, illegal. He propped up worsening numbers through paper profits and other shady things sometimes called cooking the books. This made the investors think that Penn Central was actually doing all right, when in reality, they really couldn't have been in a worse situation. By the end of 1969, the railroad had lost over $300 million since the merger, and the end of such losses seemed to be nowhere in sight. In just the first quarter of 1970 alone, they'd lost another $100 million, which is more than $1 million a day. Their track conditions suffered, and many of the locomotives that they did have had to be operated at restricted speed, which meant a lot of late shipments, which only made them look worse. Every single thing they did to try to bail themselves out of the situation made them look even worse. In June of 1970, Bavon reported to Saunders that he had completely exhausted any and all possible monetary means of dealing with the situation. There was nothing more he could do. If federal assistance couldn't be secured, the bankruptcy was their only option. June 21st, 1970, Penn Central's board voted to seek voluntary relief from their creditors under Section 77 of the Federal Bankruptcy Act. The reaction from everybody around them was actually shock. Wall Street and other business sectors never believed that this massive railway that was a combination of two of the greatest in American history would ever collapse. It was in fact the largest bankruptcy in American history for its time. It would only be superseded in 2001 by the Enron bankruptcy, but that's another story. This resulted in a serious period of uncertainty when it came to the eastern seaboard and the other rail lines. They weren't sure if they could keep their own freight moving, and many of their customers were also wary of using them. The company spent more than three years in receivership, but the trustees involved and everyone that really looked at it found that their problems were simply too complex for a traditional sort of reorganization. They couldn't just go in and divvy things up and be fine. Between the loans and the infrastructure issues and really everything, there was way too much going on to just simply walk in and fix it. It wasn't going to happen. Though weirdly, in the end, Penn Central's failure actually wound up helping railroading in America overall. For years, the United States had struggled with the notion of a nationalized railway system. We didn't really want to do it necessarily, We'd actually done it once during World War I, but that was the only exception. For the most part, we're very capitalist over here. We want private companies to do private company things. Competition breeds innovation, etc., etc. So the government didn't really want to have to step in and do anything, but with passenger lines drying up, it was eventually decided that the government would have to do something if passenger service was going to be a thing in America on the rail lines. Amtrak wound up being launched on May 1st, 1971. For the sole purpose of relieving a lot of railroads' passenger operations. The railroads were no longer responsible for dealing with them so they could focus on their freight lines, while Amtrak tried to make the passenger runs at least a little bit profitable, or bare minimum, stable. Since they were now government-owned, they didn't necessarily have to worry about making a massive profit, if any. However, much of Penn Central wind up under the control of another government-owned entity, Conrail, which was created on April 1st, 1976 that took over most of Penn Central, as well as the also bankrupt Erie-Lackawanna Railway. 
Conrail would go on to make a profit eventually, and was even privatized for a while, but not until some serious reforms came down. See, like I said in the beginning, a big part of why Penn Central struggled so hard, as well as many of the railways did, was just old laws that didn't need to be there. The ICC had too much power over them when it came to setting rates. They couldn't set rates to stay competitive with other industries. It just wasn't possible. This eventually resulted in the Staggers Rail Act of 1980. It deregulated the American railroad industry in many ways, including allowing rail carriers to establish any rate for a rail service unless the ICC were to determine that there was no effective competition for the rail services which is a thing that very rarely happens. It did a bunch of other stuff, and we can make an entire video about that, but the point is, suddenly, Conrail, as well as a lot of the other rail lines, began actually making money again. Having the freedom supplied by the free market gave them a boost. And even before the Staggers Rail Act, there was also the 4R Act, which also helped quite a bit. It's a case where the government needed to take their hands off to make things work. And since we still have several big Class 1 railways in the country today, including Norfolk Southern, CSX, BNSF, and Union Pacific, I'd say it worked out pretty well. But as for Penn Central, it kind of remains an historical cautionary tale of what can happen when you don't go into a situation with any kind of real planning. Had the ICC not dragged their feet on the merger, they might have had time to actually plan things out and slowly merge together, rather than just throwing everybody into it and hoping for the best. Saunders giving in to everything the unions wanted probably didn't help either. He could have served to actually negotiate and come to a compromise rather than just give them everything. And had the Pensies bitter old men not been so bitter and old, maybe they would have been able to make some progression and allow Perlman to do his job as an innovator. And Central may have wound up being a rail line that we still see nowadays, and yet, instead, it became one of the most notorious failures in railroading history. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267 Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Haas 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsun 131-232, Mr. Black Rose Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Lock Kraken, Twin Fox, Dimeblade 17, and Anzac A1. Till next time, this is Darkness, and a bit of a fond farewell.